A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful And may God's peace and blessings be upon His Holy Prophet Muhammad and the purified members of His household and progeny Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn wa ala awlaad al-Husayn wa ala ashab al-Husayn Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The topic for tonight's lecture is going to be the knowledge of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam about his death and this topic can be divided into two big questions. The first one has to do with whether the Imam السلام, knew that he was going to die when he went to Karbala. And the second question that follows up from this one is if the Imam knew that he was going to die, he was going to his demise in that tragic manner in Karbala, then how can he walk to his death in that manner? Is this not self-destruction and suicide? So if we start with the first question, whether the Imam knew that he was going to die or not. This question comes to us, the question of whether someone knows whether they're going to die or not, stems from a type of knowledge in the unseen, in the hidden, called Ilm al ghayb the divine knowledge in the unseen and in the hidden. And we know in the Holy Quran, it says that this type of knowledge only belongs to God. There are a number of verses that says that it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows the knowledge of the unseen and the hidden. And there are verses in the Quran, such as in Surah Luqman, that give us examples of the types of things that it is only God subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows. It tells us that it is only God who knows the knowledge of the hour, which is the day of judgment. And it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what amount of rain will come down, or what every womb carries. What kind of human being is going to be coming out of that womb when they grow up. And it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what every soul is going to do and to get the next day or in the future. And what Allah and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the land in which every soul will die. So this gives us an idea that the Holy Quran says that the knowledge of the unseen and the hidden rests only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are verses of that kind. But then we also have other verses of the Quran that seem to add something else to this. For instance, in the end of Surah Al-Jib, we have a verse that says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as it talks about God, it says, Alim al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is the knower of the hidden. فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَىٰ غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا He does not disclose his unseen to anyone. But then the next verse adds an exception. It says, إِلَّا مَنْ اَرْتَضَى مَنْ رَسُولُ Except for those who can get that from one of the messengers with whom God is pleased. So the Quran, while it recognizes that in an autonomous manner, in a sovereign manner, the knowledge of the unknown and the unseen only rests with God subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, it says that there are exceptions. And the exceptions are simply that God may decide to share that knowledge of the unknown and the unseen with some of his creatures such as some of the messengers with whom he is pleased. They may be angels, they may be prophets, and the messengers and apostles that we know. And of course, chief among them, the chief of all those messengers and the closest in proximity to God is our beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So from a Quranic point of view, it is not possible to say that the knowledge of the unseen or the hidden cannot be known by anyone but God. It rests with God initially, but God may decide to share it with some of his creatures 
through those messengers that Allah is describing in the Quran. And then when we come in practice, so this is in theory, what about in practice? In practice, we have instances upon instances in the history of the prophets and the messengers and the imams in which we are told that they knew exactly how they were going to die. In fact, this does not even stop at the level of the messengers and the divinely appointed people that God has sent to humanity. When you go in through history, you find that some of the great companions of the Holy Prophet or Imam Ali السلام, for instance, knew exactly how they were going to die. Habib ibn Mubahir and Maytham ibn Tammar are good examples. They knew how they were going to die and they knew when they were going to die and they knew the circumstances of their death. So the knowledge of one's death is not limited to the knowledge of the unseen with God subhanahu wa ta'ala because he may decide to share it through those messengers and through those divinely appointed people with the people. As for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, so this is all the introduction. Now we come to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Did he know for sure that he was going to die in Karbala? Did he know that if he were to leave the Medina to head towards Kufa and then to Karbala, that this was going to be the end of his life in that tragic manner or not? I think, first of all, given what we have said in the previous nights, we have clearly established that the Holy Prophet did not leave any doubt about the end of the life of Imam Hussein alayhi salam right from the beginning of his life. From the first day of his existence, the Holy Prophet associated the end of Imam Hussein's life with tragedy, with the martyrdom that was going to await him in the events of Karbala. So from that point of view, we know that the Holy Prophet had already established that. So the knowledge about the tragic end of Imam Hussein alayhi salam was already announced. And anyone who is in that close circle around the Holy Prophet and the Holy Prophet's family must have known about that tragic end of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And then specifically, if we continue where we left off last night, from a historic point of view, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we said, after the events that happened in Medina and before coming to the grave of the Holy Prophet that we mentioned, he actually stopped and visited a few people and a few other people came to visit him. This is the day that the Imam is starting to announce that he is about to leave the Medina. And one of the people that he came to visit was a great lady by the name of Umm Salama. Umm Salama was the great widow of the Holy Prophet. Second only to Khadija in her virtue, in her faith, in her love to Ahlul Bayt and to the Prophet specifically, in her loyalty to him. And the Holy Prophet reciprocated that to Umm Salama. So when Imam Hussein alayhi salam came to her and told her that he was leaving Medina, she asked him, she said, my son Hussein, have you really decided to go towards Iraq? And the Imam said, yes. And she told him, your grandfather, the messenger of God, has informed me that your death is going to be in Iraq. And that if you go to Iraq, there is a land called Karbala, where you will die. And he gave me a handful of sand from that land, from the exact spot where you are going to be killed. Please preserve yourself, protect yourself, and do not go. And it is said that the Imam responded, telling her, my, my dear grandmother, I am aware of the land and I am aware of the sand of Karbala, but I must still go. And then if we add to these events, the fact that anyone who lived in that time, even without the knowledge of the unseen and the divine knowledge, anyone who was reading the political landscape, People who came to Imam Hussein to give him advice and who wrote to Imam Hussein salam to give him advice, they were not all of them necessarily relying on divine knowledge. They knew that anyone who reads the political landscape could tell what would happen if the Imam went to Karbala or went to Kufa in general. And so we have the letters and the visitations between the Imam, for instance, and Abdullah ibn Ja'fa, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, ibn Abbas, so on and so forth, from the people, even Abdullah, Ibn Zubair that we mentioned yesterday, 
all of them telling the Imam it is better for him to find another plan than to head to Iraq where he most likely will be betrayed. So to say historically that the Imam did not know what was awaiting him does not really work. It does not work from all of the narrations that we have and it does not work historically. We have too much evidence that the Imam knew exactly what was going to happen. And the final event that took place in Medina that is worth mentioning before the Imam left is the sermon that the Imam gave. We have in our narrations a historic sermon that Imam Hussein alayhi salam gave right before leaving Medina, the day before his departure. We said the events that happened in the night in the palace of the governor. The next day the Imam did these visitations and he gave a sermon. And his departure was on the next day. And the Imam started his sermon by saying, I am as impatient to seeing the Holy Prophet and to seeing my father, Imam Ali, and to seeing my mother, Fatima al-Zahra, and to seeing Hamza, and to seeing Ja'far, as Ya'qub was to seeing Yusuf. And we know that the Quran tells us that Ya'qub was so impatient and eager to see Yusuf السلام, that he's lo he lost his eyesight from the amount of crying and weeping even. And the Imam says, I am even more impatient to see them than Ya'qub was to seeing Yusuf. And then the Imam continues. He says, I can clearly see the wolves of the desert of Iraq tearing my body into pieces in a region between the Nawawis and Karbala. They are filling their hungry bellies and their empty pockets. This is the plan that was devised by Allah and it is He who has considered my martyrdom as the remedy to reform this nation. And there is no escape from whatever Allah has decreed. And the Imam continued, We are the family of the Holy Prophet and we are happy with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. And we like whatever He likes. We bear with patience whatever tribulations He sends our way. And in return, He gives us our full reward, the one that, we ha that He has reserved only to the most patient of His servants. I am a part of the body of God's messenger, and a part of His body cannot remain separate from Him. I shall join Him in paradise, so that he may be pleased to see me fulfill the promise that he has made me. And then the Imam adds, only he among you who is prepared to sacrifice his life for my sake and to meet Allah should accompany me on this trip. And the Imam added by saying, God willing, I intend to depart tomorrow morning. So anyone who reads this sermon in case we say that everything else was behind closed doors, between the close family members and relatives and people who were close to the Imam, when we read this, this is a public statement from the Imam in Medina, clearly announcing what is to come in the days and the weeks ahead after these events. So if we keep all of this in mind, how can we justify that the Imam actually walked to his own death? There is a verse in the Holy Quran that is often mentioned by those who want to object and say that the Imam was not allowed, should not have undertaken this trip. And the reason I mention it is because this verse usually is referred to and no one mentions the point that this verse has nothing to do with the point that, that is being debated. They take a part of the verse and the part of the verse basically says, وَلَا تُرْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَ Do not cast yourselves into a annihilation or destruction with your own hands. The problem is that they do not look at the entire verse from beginning to end. The beginning of the verse is talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking people and give from your money, donations and charity. And then the verse says, and do not throw yourselves into destruction and be good to others for Allah loves those who are good. So the context of the verse has a lot more to do with donating charities. It's talking about a problem that unfortunately I don't think many of us have. The verse is basically saying that there is a limit when you give donations and charity. Do not give to the point where you bankrupt yourself. 
And then you become one of the needy ones who is going to need charity and you become a burden on society yourself. And then the verse comes back to rebalance and it says, but do give and do good to others. Do virtue to others because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who do good to others. So the mention of this verse very quickly is only to establish that it doesn't really have to do with this event. There are other verses that may be used at least to establish the argument and even those can be responded as we will show. There are verses for instance that say do not kill yourselves. So this verse specifically if you hear it surrounding these events it is easy to dismiss in that manner. Now, do we really need a verse of the Qur'an to tell us that one should not destroy themselves? If we look at all the religions of the world throughout history, has there ever been a religion, a school of thought, a leader who considers self-destruction acceptable? No. All the religions of the world are in agreement that self-destruction is completely unacceptable. And if we turn to normal society and logic people, is there anyone who considers, for instance, suicide acceptable? If we look at society today, does anyone consider suicide acceptable? Of course not. Allow me here to make a quick digression and I go back to the topic at hand. This idea, this topic, this subject of suicide, I think for the most of us, Years ago, we had been hearing about it as a problem that occurs everywhere in the world. And I think that we've always imagined that this is not a problem that will ever make it into our own communities. When I think the majority of the brothers and sisters who are well informed about the news of our communities now, we know that there have been multiple cases of suicide now within our communities especially in the communities, the, the community of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. There have been multiple instances now. And this means that if there are people who have committed suicide, it means that there are many, many more who are contemplating and considering and thinking about committing suicide. And this means that if there was a time where we could pretend that this is a problem that will never make it into our own communities, we now know that this is a problem that is within our homes. It has reached our communities. And there are brothers and sisters who have started to work in that regard. There are people who are qualified within our communities, people who have the qualifications, who have studied psychology and counseling and therapy, who understand this from a professional point of view, and there are people who are looking at it from an Islamic point of view, but the problem is that this is still a very individual effort that we have here and there. This is a community problem. Followers of Ahlul Bayt should not be despairing from life to the point of killing themselves. We need to work together as institutions, as Islamic centers, as mosques, as organizations, to make sure that we address these social and cultural issues in an urgent and in a pressing manner. These are crises that should not be allowed. We have to prevent them the moment we see that they're starting to creep into our community. So I mentioned this in passing. I apologize, I'll go back to my topic. But I think that it's important to make these points as we go along and to relate the theory and the history and the aqa'id to our everyday lives and problems. If we look at the manner in which today's societies deal with self-destruction, we see that they do everything they can. There is services, there are hotlines, there are people who are dedicated to making sure that if anyone is even thinking about committing suicide or destroying their lives, ending their lives, that there are services, there are places, there are people to talk to, to prevent and reduce and diminish this in society. <clears throat> so there is no question that this form of self-annihilation that usually comes from despair, usually comes from not having the fortitude to deal with the problems, the, pro the difficulties, the tests that we go through in life, to the point where we decide to end our life, this is definitely seen in a negative light. There's no question about that. But does that mean that society considers everyone who pl puts themselves, who places themselves on the line of fire 
who, sat, who is willing to sacrifice their life, to risk their life, does society consider all those people in a negative light? Absolutely not. It depends. There are situations and there are people that we all know in our societies, for instance, police officers and soldiers and firemen who are respected and commanded in societies for the work they do, even though they are placing themselves in the line of fire and risking their lives and sometimes sacrificing their lives intentionally on a daily basis. Why? Because those people are not acting on a selfish, in a selfish manner. And they're not doing this in a manner which shows despair and giving up in front of the difficulties of life. Instead, these people are sacrificing what they have nearest and dearest to them to ensure that the quality of life, the safety of those around them and the things they believe in continues and improves with time. So if we take this back to the events of Karbala, can we not say that this is the manner in which Imam Hussain was behaving? Were these not higher principles according to which and for which the Imam was willing to sacrifice his life and to see the lives of his companions go as a price in return for those principles? Let me add one more point, perhaps this one from a more theological, technically theological point of view. Our scholars say that knowledge of the divine, this kind of divine knowledge of the unseen and the hidden, is absolutely possible as established in the Holy Quran. But it comes with a condition. That condition is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you this type of knowledge, this type of divine blessing and knowledge, you are only to use it in God.